We are still on this uh, step to happiness. <laughs> Isn't it nice? Constantly talking about happiness. We all want to be happy, but we have to do the work. Sorry, happiness doesn't come out from the blue moon. Happiness come out from cultivation. Okay. So we remember last time we talked about um, uh, what did we talk about? <laughs> I better ask you guys. <laughs> yeah, you were not here, so you are exempted. <laughs> <laughs> what did we talk about? <laughs> and an unwholesome mental state cannot arise at the same moment when one is mindful. Wow. That's very good. That's the, actually the it's the very last sentence, right? <laughs> good good notes. Okay. So we are on to the second, second um, part of the cultivation. There are four parts to this, right? The second part is ab abandoning the, uh, our recent unwholesome mental states. That means whatever that has already arisen, we would like to abandon them. We would like to you know, really get rid of it, but not in a negative sense. Uh, you know, the Buddha said actually, what all the teachers and the Buddha said, before we become enlightened, we actually cannot have any controls and, and choose whatever thoughts that, has, that, that come to our mind. We don't have the right to choose. We can't choose. The thoughts just come. Just come. Because like, like a field, like in the field, there are so many seeds in the field. You cannot control that, okay, today you come out and tomorrow you come and this day you don't come. No. It's just like us. Our, our, our mind is just like a field. And there are so many seeds in there. So we don't have any control on which seed will come up. So that means we don't have any control of what thoughts to come up. All right? But we have the control of how to deal with that thought. Okay? So therefore don't feel any guilty or shameful if, we, if, if you start to react to your negativities. But that doesn't give you an excuse to react to your negativities, right? Um, when you start to react, that means you lost that mindfulness. Because mindfulness, when you lost that mindfulness, then you start to react. When you are mindful, you will actually, at that moment, you know, when we talk about this mindfulness, there's this really faint, wrong, perception at the back of our mind that it seems that mindfulness is actually so long right but actually mindfulness is just like, like this like that so at that each moment of mindfulness when we are mindful actually at that moment we, our mind does not have any negativity just a flick of moment this is actually even too long already so each moment is so, so f fast that this really gross mind cannot pick up how long the moment is. But we, in the back of, the, I mean, in the back of my mind, when I said mindful, I always think, oh, there's so, so, so much mindfulness in there. But you know, it's actually, there are thousands or millions of mindfulness in really that little moment. Okay, so we really need to make, we really need to make that clear. Okay, so the Buddha said, herein the disciple rouses his will to overcome the evil, unwholesome states. You know, that evil is not, it's not the right word, yeah, I, the unskillful, unwholesome states that have already arisen. So if you, are, if you become aware that there is actually unwholesome states which have already arisen, what do we do? <coughs> we, we make effort. He makes effort. And he stirs up his energy. He makes effort. That means he becomes aware. Okay, there's this negativity. He stirs up his energy. Okay, what am I going to do? So I'm going to tell you what you can do later on. But this is what the Buddha said. And he makes effort. He stirs up his energy. It's just like you beat up the egg to make the foam so that your cake will rise better. Right? So you stirs up that energy. And he exerts his mind and strives. He exerts his mind in that very moment, using that kind of energy 
to deal with that kind of negativity. And the very important word is actually he strives on. So that mindfulness is continuous. It's not just like boom, gone. Right? But a lot of time our mindfulness is, yeah, come, boom, gone. <laughs> and then we start to <laughs> we start to react, right? And we forget. But when when you notice that you can actually remember to be mindful, <gasps> you take a deep breath. <gasps> I am reacted. I am reacting. That's a wonderful moment. That's a beautiful moment. That's what we need to do, is to strive on to get more, more, more of those moments. Okay? So don't blame yourself. Don't feel guilty. Don't feel shameful. Oh, darn. I reacted again. Don't feel, but don't, but don't let that become an excuse for you not to improve yourself, to change yourself. So, when one responds to hindrances, we, it actually it, it, it depends on, on how entrenched that in hindrance is. Sometimes the hindrance is not very, very entrenched, like very entangled. It, you know, you can just deal with, oh, yes, there is this awareness of this hindrance. You know, remember those five hindrances? Jeopardy. Okay, answers, please. Okay. Drowsiness always come with Drowth. dullness, right? Yeah. Doubt. Restlessness. Oh, restlessness and oh, that's the that, you, you definitely have the, the <laughs> tremendous experience with that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Laziness. Laziness. Okay. What are the five? Hatred. Hatred, yeah, aversion. What is the again? Sluggishness. Huh? Sluggishness. Oh, we, they mentioned that, sluggishness. Yeah. Ha somebody mentioned craving? Craving. Craving, yes. Greed, ill will, dullness and drowsiness, restlessness and worry. And then, uh, what's the other one? Doubt. Doubt, yeah. Doubt. Sorry. <laughs> so, so when, when, when any of these hindrances arise, it, how, how fast it disappears actually depends on how entrenched it is. And whether we are able to catch it right when it arises. When it just arises, it's not very powerful. When it, you, I think through your meditation experience, you should, you should actually notice this already. When anything, when any negativity arises, it's not very powerful. But what makes it powerful? The energy that you get. Huh? Yeah, you're rolling in it, right? It's just like a roller coaster. You keep rolling in it. You just keep thinking and going, thinking and feeding and feeding and feeding. It's just like a snowball. A snowball, you know, rolling down in the snow and giving back bigger and bigger and you still don't realize. And you allow it to go on, go on, go on forever. And by the time you realize that you have to deal with it, oh gosh, it's so huge. It's so powerful. It actually already overpower you, overwhelm you, and you completely lost that strength to actually stand up and deal with it again. That's why some people during meditation, they feel so tired. Why would they feel so tired? Because they allow this negativity, this unwholesome thought to arise and allows it to take over. And so you, 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 you're burning off all that energy. The whole body, the whole mind, the, all the energy is gone into feeding that snowball. And what did you get at the, rest of, at the end of the day? Nothing. You don't replenish your, your, your body. I was very tired just now. When I was meditating, I said, oh, so heavy, so heavy, so heavy. Oh, so heavy and so much pain in my body. <laughs> so much pain in my shoulder, so much pain in my neck. 
Oh, so heavy. I said, come on. You're not complaining to the heaviness, that pain? You're complaining to the pain? I said, okay. You are a meditation teacher and you complain <laughs> to the pain? <laughs> and I started feeling that pain a little bit more and more. You know, I'm a human being. I, I'm tired. I just don't go. I don't want to do anything. I observed and observed, and then that mind really started to calm down so much. And by the time I look at the, the, the clock, it was already 20 to 7. You know, and it's just, I feel so much more energetic now because I didn't feed into that, that, that reactive mind. So what I said tonight, I, I think it's actually very nice what I said tonight in the, in the meditation thing is actually a great reminder to myself is you notice what is happening to you and you notice what is happening in you and you notice what is happening from you that is true mindfulness doesn't matter what kind of technique you are using that's all you you want to know through every any technique you want to understand that thing right there at that moment so maybe if you could if you could solve like Take a back step and then start looking at it. You, 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 you're actually helping yourself to settle down, helping yourself to heal, helping yourself to correct and change. Oh, such such wonderful gift that we have this mindfulness thing. All right. So if you don't catch it and you allow it to proliferate, it just we just have to take stronger and stronger measures. So. So the word of the Buddha, he said, he does not retain any thought of sensual lust, ill will, or harmlessness, or any other evil and unwholesome states that may have arisen. So we don't hold it in there. We don't hold it in there. And we don't, we don't see it as my thing. It's not my thing. It's just arising because of so many conditions coming together to make it arise. It doesn't matter you you call it wholesome or you call it unwholesome, you call it a wonderful relationship or you call it a horrible relationship, whatever you call it this person, your wife, you call this person, your daughter, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's just all karmic relationship. It's all karmic. And it all happens because those conditions are there to make it happen. If those conditions are not there, it won't happen. Okay? So, I always say, don't make yourself to be one of the conditions that make it happen. Right? So, how can you stop making yourself to be one of the conditions that make it happen? Is You take a step backward and you watch it mindfully. Rather than diving yourself into it. Okay? It's not easy, but it, you know, that's the best way out. And he said he abandons them, he dispels them, he destroys them, and he causes them to disappear. So these are the ways, these are the ways to actually deal with any unwholesome states that may have arisen. Okay, so these, actually he, 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 he's, only mentioned, it seems that he only mentioned four, but all the part, all the teachers said there are actually five ways. Oops. Oh, you see in all. Okay, never mind. We, t we take one after another. Okay, actually, there are five ways to, to deal with this. The five techniques. First one is ignore it. Ignore it. That means you don't pay any attention to the unwholesome thought. The Buddha said, all things arise in your mind only when you pay attention to them. It's true, isn't it? When you don't pay attention to them, they, they, don't, they don't stay. So you ignore them. Is it easy to ignore? Sometimes. That's the easiest way, though. <laughs> That's the easiest way, That's the Buddha said. It is the easiest way. You know, you look at we we look at these five steps. It's actually one step. You know, one step is actually getting more and more difficult. You think that suppression is difficult? This, this is actually very difficult. 
suppressing that mental thoughts is actually very difficult. Ignoring it is easier. I remember last week we went to your class, Laurie. Remember um, that little girl said, oh, I don't like the sound, I just, have, I just shut my ears. That's ignoring it, right? I just shut my eyes, it, that's ignoring it. Okay? So, you have something to say, Laurie? Yeah, yeah, it is not a good thing. But if you have tried all these things and it doesn't work, and the only thing that you can not allow this snowball to roll on right. is to suppress it, is <laughs> to stop it rolling. Mm -hmm. So you have to f use the force to stop it rolling. Okay, that's that's what it means by suppression, right? Okay, so and. And the second thing is, oh, sorry, uh, deliberate diversion of attention. So we intentionally turning our attention away from the unwholesome thoughts. And it does shut down the attention. Uh, that is, you know, required or asked by your unwholesome thought at that time, okay? Because at that time, the unwholesome thought would draw a lot of your attention then if you sort of deliberately divert that attention away from the unwholesome thought, you are not actually feeding it. So, how can you divert that attention? You do something else. You can go to what? You go work in the garden. Yes, that's the best thing. One of the best things. Some people go shopping. Shopping. I'll do that too. You do that too. <laughs> I remember your 10 days meditation course. Yeah, I remember. It's called therapy shopping. Yeah, therapy shopping. Oh, oh, wow. What a beautiful name given to some excuse, right? And some people go into eating. Some people go into alcohol. Some people go into drugs. So it depends on, on what draws that person. And they think that is a good diversion, going into drugs, going into alcohol. It is not. Actually, it will cause um, more, more problems, right? Um, so that deliberate diversion of attention is the second step that you can take. So, and then the third one is to replacing the hindrances with its opposite. I need to talk a little bit more detail on this, so I'll go into the next slide to talk about this. So let us wait until the next slide to talk about this. Replacing the hindrances with this opposite, okay? And then we go to the, four, the fourth one, the confrontation to the thoughts. So you actually look at the thoughts face to face. Okay, what thoughts have I got? At that time, in here, actually you need a very strong mind. A very strong mind. Okay, you confront that unwholesome thought. Okay, what have I got now? Instead of turning away, you just look at it. And try to scrutinize it, try to analyze it, try to dig into it, try to pierce into it. With so much determination, determination, you want, you want to understand what it is in the back of this thing. And where does it come, come about? I remember I talked to a, to a very um, a seasoned meditator last week when he visited us. And he, he, he mentioned something about he wanted to go and do a long course in his, in his home. He hasn't, done, he hasn't done a long course, I mean 30-day course before. And he said he wanted to do a long course in his home um, you know, without having have to go to a meditation center. I said, okay, all right. So you want to do a long course. It's a very good, it's a very good thought. It's wonderful thought, wholesome. But I said, what, why do you want to do a long course in your home, right? He didn't, he didn't give me an answer. He just gave me a story, a big story, you know, going around here, going around there, and going around here. Oh, yeah, your Paul said that. I talked to Paul, and I talked to this person. I talked hey, talk to everybody, but he didn't give me an answer. I said, come on, come on, come back. Come back, listen to me. Why do you want to do a long course at home? Why can't you leave your home? Why? And he started giving me a story again. <laughs> I looked at it. Come on, you answer my question. So you know he's actually evading, he's avoiding telling me the deep reason. So it, only when you start to really look deep down inside that mind, you 
the otherwise you you will never be able you will never be able to understand it. You will never be able to actually rectify the situation. Right? Can't you just reason with those thoughts? And change those thoughts to more enlightened thoughts? Yeah, yes, of course you can reason. Of course there's yeah, in, in here when you confront it when you confront you find out the reasons why it is there, then you start to reason it. You say, hey, come on, this is not really proper. Like, yeah, talking yeah. to that part of your mind that's yeah. thinking those thoughts. Yeah, this is really unwholesome. Until that, that part of your mind changes its mind. Yeah, very good. That's, that's the way it is. But sometimes it's so difficult to reason with it. Right? Until you really understand what is really deep down. Otherwise, when you keep reasoning, it keeps fighting you. Because you haven't dug down it deep enough to understand what's the core reason behind it. And if you didn't go deep enough, no matter what kind of reasons you give to it, it always finds something to actually tell you that you know, you're not right. Sorry, I can't accept your, your reason. Right? Unless you really, you really, really go deep down and understand it, and of course, um, you know, you, you, you reason and then you talk to it, and you. Once you start to really find a way, to understand it and accept it the way it is, and then. Allow it to happen, inside, not allow it to express, and allow it to happen inside. And allow it to actually allow yourself to actually watch it happening, and if you think that you can actually neutralize it with some other good thoughts, that also would be possible. Would be okay. Okay. And I, also, one thing is when you start to actually watch this uh, confrontation, you will start to understand what's the nature of the of those thoughts. The thoughts keep changing, right? Even though, the, yes, more. Like, would there not be a very fine line between reasoning and justifying? There is, there is this. Mm. Sometimes you can have, like, I mean, we'll, we'll just go shopping again. Um, you want to purchase something, and you probably know that you probably shouldn't. So if you're going to have this confrontation in your thought process, um, there can be the, the case of, okay, reasoning, well, I don't have any other summer tops, and this is a really good deal, so this is a good time to buy it, as opposed to... Well, when you are judgmental, you will say to yourself, stop it. You don't need any of those anymore. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. So that's judgmental, that you're actually reacting with the reaction. But reasoning, you actually, you actually try to find out. Okay, is it really needed? Mm -hmm. Is it really needed? Do I really ha don't have a summer top? You know, but judgmental, you don't need a summer top. Come on, go away, walk away, <laughs> right? It's it's not actually a fine line. It's actually quite obvious. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. By accepting these dark thoughts and and sending meta and just so we'll seeing talk, that it's there. We'll talk about that in the next slide. Okay. It's the third. It's actually replacing the hindrances with this opposite. Mm -hmm. You're right. Okay. But I want to finish with this one, confrontation to the thoughts. It's when you confront the thoughts and you start, if you really start to confront and really start and watch and you notice those thoughts actually come and go, come and go. They change it. They change. Mm -hmm. And when you start when you start to understand that they change or, or you start to notice that it changes, remember, remember that's the nature of all things. And if you start to remember that that law, that that wisdom would come up. It's a why am I so stubbornly attached to this thought? Can I just stand back a little and let it happen? <coughs> because it's all an itcher. It's all impermanent, right? You also start developing like sensations in your body when you're staying <coughs> with those thoughts. 
Yes. And if we focus on the sensation. sensations, it kind of it dissipates. It yes. Well. Yes, yes, yes. There's one very good technique of doing that too. The sensation part. So, so that's why that's why you know different meditation different meditation techniques actually allow you to deal with that mind at different at different state in different uh, in different ways uh, so like anger when you go you go back and you observe that that okay you see this uh, very strong bodily sensations happening and coming and going right or when you have this very strong lust a sexual lust, we go into the next slide, is you start to look at the anatomical parts of the body, which is, this is really not very nice looking, you know? <laughs> then you start to realize, you know, why attach, right? So we go into that. So when you confrontation to the thoughts, of course, these, all these techniques can be used concurrently. Right, concurrently. Except the first one, when you ignore it, then you don't need to do any other any other of these four, right? When you ignore it, but these four can be work concurrently together, to, you know, to help you to overcome this. So when the suppression, this is the last resort, when all of the above don't work. You try very vigorously trying to restrain yourself. Um, uh, to actually to to pay any attention to this unwholesome thought, it's just like a, a wrestler, you know. That when they fight, the 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 heavier one, the stronger one, actually, you know, throw himself down onto that the other partner and then hold him down with all his bodily weight and will, just so that for three seconds, one, two, three, then it's gone. He wins, right? That's that's, that's how you quit smoking. Oh really? I don't. I haven't. I haven't smoked, <laughs> so I don't know how I to quit smoking. Is that right? I smoked for thirty years, and then you, you had to use that last step. Oh really? Yes. That's how you quit smoking. One, two, three. I have, no. <laughs> <laughs> it took two years. It took two years. No, before I stopped thinking about cigarettes. Oh. But you um. had to keep doing something else and suppressing those thoughts for oh, cigarettes. Right. I remember one of my friends, she used to come to meditate with us. Uh, how she quit smoking is one day she got up and looked at that, that secret packet. She got so much anger towards that secret packet. She dumped it into the washroom, she thrust it off and said, I don't want to see you anymore in this lifetime. Good for her. Good for her, she stopped <laughs> right there. 30 yeah. years of smoking. I smoked 20, 30 years. 28 or 30, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You smoked 30 years. I had 30 years and I quit. I quit wow. cold turkey. Wow. Could I ask you a question? Did you have a specific reason to quit? I started liking myself and I didn't want to hurt my body anymore. That's very good. <laughs> yeah, that's love towards oneself is so important. Yeah. Right. And that's how I quit. Anybody who doesn't who doesn't love themselves, they, they start hurting themselves. Mm -hmm. I quit for Catherine's sake. My daughter. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh. One night she was Filled up like a pretzel on a film, coughing, coughing, and I oh. thought, well, if I don't do something about this, who will? She's my girl, and oh. so I had to do it for her. Wow, and you did quit just right there? Right. The axe right to the root. Just like me quitting chicken, right? <laughs> <laughs> just right there, right overnight. <laughs> just for my mummy, and uh, just quit chicken for 31 years. <laughs> Yeah, that really, you know, I didn't suppress that, 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 that desire of eating chicken. I've never suppressed it in the last 30 years. It never came back. It never came back. So, so it's not actually a suppression. It's really a, 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 a complete <laughs> transformation, I think. It's a complete transformation. Yeah. But isn't it, for most of us, uh, getting to the fifth, this fifth point there is the hardest? It because is. we usually lose our already equanimity, already mindfulness. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. yes. So by that time, it's a little too late to surprise. <laughs> by that time, actually, the unwholesome, the unwholesome thought would be so strong. It becomes so overwhelming. Becomes so overwhelming, then you remember there is still one last step that you can do. It's just suppress it. Just push it down. 
all your thoughts clench your teeth. Just clench your teeth. Like when you sit in meditation and then there's this thought arising, it never leaves you and just keep haunting you and just, okay, okay, you you better say, oh, I'm going to look at you. I'm going to watch you. Uh, you just you just fight it. You just have to fight it. It's actually very difficult. That's that's why that's why the teachers put them in the last last step, right? We think it is the first step. But no, it actually is the last step. Yeah. So okay. So we look at the third one. Is replacing the hindrances with its opposite. Is there actually this is the third technique that we can use? Is expel the defiled thought with its opposites. Uh, that means a uh, 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 replacing a uh, unwholesome thought with a wholesome thought. And uh, the Buddha actually t- uh, talk about that in a simile. He said, like a, like a, like a rotten pillar in, in a house, um, when, when we find that the house is actually shaking, it becomes very unstable. You look, you check, you check everything, and you see, oh, this is rotten. This is a rotten pillar. And you don't have to take the whole house down. You don't have to remove the whole house. You just have to take that pillow down and replace it with a new one. That's what he ad- ad- advised us to do, is to replace this unwholesome thought with, with a wholesome thought. So he said, for each of these hindrances, there is actually um, a specific antidote. Okay? And, and, and when we are aware that we try to put that into perspective, Okay. When we are aware of what kind of um, unwholesome thought that we have, then we try to put that into perspective and allow this other thought to arise and allow these other thoughts to come in to our mind at that time to actually you know, neutralize this unwholesome thought. Okay, so this, the first one is the desire, any desire, any desire. Not, not just the sexual desire, it's not sensual desire, just any desire, you know, desire for fame, desire for relationship, you know, or you know, desire for anything or praise, whatever. Seeing that everything is impermanent, everything is in that flux of changes, and nothing, nothing is going to be permanently there. This is actually very, very. You can see it in in uh, very vividly in 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 end stage people with their families. The families would try to do everything just to keep them one more hour or even one more minute. Last resort, they would do everything for themselves. It's not for the dying person. I see so many of these happening in hospice, right? And at that time, I always tell the, tell the, tell the families, why do you want this doctor to do this thing? Why? Because I don't want them to leave because I love them. It's always start with I. And it seldom starts with because he is he is precious to us. Us. And so this this desire, if we don't start to see this impermanent nature of all things, then this that desire is going to kill us. It's going to hurt us, it's going to hurt our relationship, it's going to hurt everybody. As I told you before, um, uh, one of my student uh, husband was so ill in ICU and all tubes and everything. And and, uh, his wife told me about him, I said, okay, after today's meditation, I'll come. So there was one day meditation, I went out and I looked at him, he, to me, he's already dead. His face showed me that he's already dead. But he's hanging on. The machine is helping him to hang on. And I said, geez, I said, are you okay? I asked his wife. His wife says, I'm okay. I accept this totally. I said, well, then you have to try, you know, you have to try to actually support him to go his path. I said, that's all you can do. So that was an evening, and then the next morning, his wife called again and said, "Well, Sifu, the doctor wanted me to uh, unplug all the tubes." I said, "Okay." I said, "When? Whenever I'm ready." 
I said, are you ready? He said, she said, I'm ready, but not my children, the two boys. They are in their late 20s, 30s. I said, okay. I said, what do you want me to do? She said, if you could come. Of course, they know because I live so far away from Vancouver. If you could come. I said, sure, I will come. And so I, I, I went. I went right in the morning, it was like 11 something in the morning, I saw him oh, so dead and I saw the two boys and I said to the wife, I said, so have the boys accepted? She said, no. They still wanted the doctor to do a, a, a spinal fluid last night, like taking, you know, spinal fluid. I said, really? And they still wanted the doctor to see why he's so bloated, you know, the abdomen, why he's so bloated, to do a, an, an ultrasound on the abdomen. I said, okay, so I need to talk to them. <laughs> so I took, the, I took the voice out. I said, let us, have a, let, let us go and have a coffee. At that time, I still can't have coffee. Now I can't anymore. <laughs> so I, so I, we, had, we sat down with a cup of coffee, I said, so, you know what's happening with your dad? And the older boy said, yes, I know. I said, how long do you think that he's going to last? You know what the older boy said? I think he's already gone. I said, wow, good for you. Then I talked to the younger boy. I said, so what, what do you think? He said, no, I can't, I can't accept that. No, he's not gone. He's still here. Then I talked to him, I said, so why, why do you think that he's still here? What is in your mind? He said, I don't want him to go. I still have a lot of things to talk to him about. We still wanted to go to on trips. We still wanted to do all this and all that, all that, all that, all that. I said, but did you see how he is now? He said, yes, I know. I said, he is actually suffering a lot. And he hardly had any flesh. And he's sustained on all these tubes. And you think if you wanted him to be here and he should be going through all this suffering? What do you feel if that was you? It's difficult to put that right in front of them. But at, that, at times, you have to do that. And he said, he didn't say anything. He just looked at me. He, was, he had a lot of anger. I think he was angry that I said something like that. It's too hurtful, right? But I knew that's, that's not time, no time at all. I said, you know, you think about that again and again. That is your dad's life, it's not your life. And you have your own life to deal with, and he has his own life to deal with. That's it. We are all independent entities, but we all have relationship with each other. And he just looked at me and said, that's all I have to say. I said, but I recommend you guys to do a life review, life review with, your, with your father when there is nobody around, just, just the four of you, your mom, you and your brothers and your, your sister-in-law. Just do a life review, like you know, sitting by the ICU the sick bed and just talk about the happy things in the past. Not the sad thing, happy things of the past. And the mom said, oh, well, you know, when we, when we, when we, when we dated each other, we didn't have any money, so we had, we had McDonald's, and there was only like $3 left in our pocket, you know. And now we have two big sons and, you know, wonderful kids and all that. Her mom just actually just came up with all those beautiful words and I said, that's the, that's the thing, you just talk about that. So when everybody left, they started talking, they started talking about their past for a couple of hours, just by the bed, just talking and chatting and talking and chatting. And then the, the, the oldest son started looking at the, all these machines because the doctor were going to come in and unplug. Looking at the machine, and it was still like beating in a normal, normal pace. And then the, the, the younger son went to talk to the mom and said, Mom, I'm ready. I'm ready anytime you can unplug. 
Mom said, no, it's not me. You go and tell your dad that you are ready. Don't tell me. I'm ready already. And he looked at his mom and said, are you sure? And his mom said, oh yeah, that is his wife. That is his life. It's not my life. So he went to talk to his dad in the years. And then when he walked closer to, to, his, to his bed, the heartbeat started going down, slower, blood pressure going down. And then he said something in, in his ears. I think he probably said, I'm ready, Dad. Please go whenever you're ready. We love you and all that. You know, all these things. And it was like 60 heartbeat. And then the, the blood pressure was like 80 and 60. And then all of a sudden, the heartbeat just went boom, zero. Stopped. After he finished talking to his dad, just stopped like that. Within minutes. And you see how, how, how strong a human mind can be? Holding on to that breath until the, the, the person is ready. Of course, he loved them, right? He loved them so much. And so, <laughs> this is actually outside this topic, but I think it's nice to share because when you start to see impermanence in life, you don't start to actually force things to change according to your wishes. Okay? Oh, okay. Now, sensual desire. Oh, we all have to deal with this. <laughs> the Buddha actually gave us a very good uh, meditative um, technique to deal with this sensual desire is um, the unattractive nature of the body. All these anatomical parts, and you, you start looking at it. Oh, look at all this urine, look at all this blood, look at all this phlegm, and look at all this, you know, whatever and you look at all these bones and it's not nice these are not really pleasant things <laughs> you don't need to have you know consistently and permanently try to entertain it what we are you know all these sensual pleasures because look at the eyes and the ears and everything it's just that we, we pick up all these stimuli and going there Actually, we are pleasing, pleasing this body to have this wonderful sensation. Wonderful sensation. And, and, and that sensation is impermanent also, right? So remember that we talked about that skeleton thing last week? Yeah. So when you start to look deeply into yourself, you could start you know, feeling that into yourself. Uh, during meditation, you feel the skin. You feel the flesh, you feel the bones. I said, who am I? Who are you? You just said the bones. That's covered with some 20 pounds, 100 pounds of flesh and a five feet skin, five square f <laughs> you know, or six feet skin all over the place covered with blonde hair, brown hair, no hair. Gray hair. Gray hair or a double color hair, triple color hair. It's, so what's attractive? Why do I have to consistently try to entertain this physical existence with all, with all these sensual things? It's because we paint a picture. Yes. That we want to hang on to. Yes. Yeah. Which is not yeah. 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 <laughs> that's why it's you know that's why people it has so 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 much difficulty trying to detach from self, themselves from sensual desire. Very difficult, very difficult. And, and for one thing, you know, a monk and a nun has to do is to, you know, with celibacy, right? It's so difficult for some people to keep celibacy, especially in the West. In the West, it's, celibacy is, is like a weird thing, isn't it? <laughs> Not to some of us, but because, you know, sex is such a, you know, nothing in the West. Nothing. It's just nothing. It's just like very casual thing. It's just, it seems like a part of our life. So keeping celibacy is actually very difficult for some people. Very difficult. Because it's so, I don't know how to express it. It's so casual. 
Yeah. It never used to be like that. It's the last like, few generations. Really? I thought it's always been like that. No? I don't think so. No? No? Mm-hmm. no? It's just the last, the last few generations, I think, that have become more and more and more open and more and more casual. I think since like the, the hippie era and... Oh. But I don't think beyond. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, hopefully that won't last too long. Because I just look at the different generations and the things that I would have maybe discussed with my mom are certainly not, you know, being discussed now. Not have discussed with my mom. My children are discussing with me, whereas I don't. And then my grandkids are more open with their mother. On like it's just it's totally it's different. Yeah. Oh, I, you know, I hope this this will turn around very <coughs> soon because um, with this, with this, um, with this really strong attachment to this sensual desire, is going to bring about so much um, uh, so uh, difficulties in societies. You know, in societies, in families, we have we're going to have more and more broken families, more and more uh, uh, difficult families, difficult ki- uh, uh, children more and more right so unless it turn around very soon okay and then then the ill will as you said with loving kindness with metta anybody that you see oh that you know I, you, you don't like or you, you even hate can you try to do a loving kindness it's very difficult <laughs> and you somebody you hate I can't love him how can I love him but if you start to sort of putting that notion of I cannot love my enemy down and try to do it, then it, it a completely turn around. It could be a completely turn around. Uh, I did that to my. It's just another side of the coin. It is. You think you don't like someone, but they're just. You know, it's just someone. Your, it's some someone is actually it's just the reflection of yourself exactly. also. When when we when we start to radiate with a lot of um, loving kindness, you know the whole the whole the whole area around us would be you know feel so much joy and and peacefulness. Okay, so dullness and drowsiness. So how? <coughs> How can you deal with this dullness and, and, and drowsiness? Have a nap. <laughs> huh? Have a nap. Have a nap. That's a good. I did have a nap today. <laughs> um, that some teachers actually, some teachers actually give you some some techniques. Is the first thing is, you can visualize a, a really brilliant, bright uh, ball of light. That actually could actually arouse that wakefulness in you. Getting up, do something, do other things, or go for a very brisk walk, or uh, start to reflect on on death. This is actually a very good meditation technique. It's a reflection on death. Why? Because this could be your last breath, and what happens if you and your life in that dullness and drowsiness. Where will you be? You will be in darkness. So you then don't have an The French uh, have a, an expression, SAD. SAD? It's like death of, the, death of the spirit. Oh, death of the spirit, okay. D- death of a spirit, D-A-S. <laughs> death of, okay. So, you know, reflection on death could actually help you to overcome this dullness and drowsiness a lot. And you always think, oh, this could be my last breath. If it is not, then you start breathing again. Then, oh, well, then you know, this is at least one breath closer to death. Isn't it true? Mm-hmm. It is Every true. Breath. Every breath is, yes. I, just, I think that might be good philosophy for life. Yeah. Exactly. It's actually not just a philosophy, it's like practical. It's a real practical practice for, for how to live one life. Yeah. 
is you know just to treasure that life, that moment of of, of life. So when you know, sometimes I counsel some people who wanted to kill themselves or hurt themselves. I said, "What is the most precious in your life?" And they would say, you know, something. I said, "Okay, if you want to kill yourself, where does that go? You don't hold on to any of those precious things anymore, right?" Then, uh, then, then I will lead you, lead them, lead them back to the breath. I said, try to stop breathing. I said, hold the breath as long as you can until they they need to gasp for air. I said, <gasps> okay. When you're gasping for air, that means you wanted to fight for life. Otherwise, you can just keep holding your breath and kill yourself right in front of me. Why don't you? Well, you want to kill yourself, right? Kill yourself right in front of me. I'll send you meta. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it's, it's so it's it, reflection on, on death is actually a very very good practice, so that you treasure everything. Yes, yes, and or simply just make a firm determination that I'm going to strive on, and stand up and meditate right there. Open eyes, just stand up and okay. I will see. Remember that monk I told you, sitting next to the cliff. He has so much dullness and drowsiness. Okay, he said, "You, you still have this dullness and drowsiness." Okay, I'll sit next to the cliffs and see how you are. And he fell, right? He broke his back. Remember, he broke his back, and in the whole 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 life, he was he he walked with a hunchback, and he sat on a chair. He never lied down to sleep. Was he dull? He was Did he was bright. Oh no, oh, oh yeah, he, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. Never fall asleep again, <laughs> never. So and restlessness and worry, turn to a, a more simple meditative tool like uh, like a, like a feeling the in breath or feeling the out breath, of just feeling the breath. Don't go to the too complicated uh, meditation technique. Okay. Or just put your attention to you know to a part of the body that you can actually feel that you you get grounded. Sometimes it could be the soles of the feet. Sometimes it could be the top of the head. You can actually put that you know attention over there so that you get yourself grounded, and you don't worry anymore. And remember, worrying is that means you have lost that awareness to the present moment. You start worrying, okay? And then with doubt, we know. We reason, we explore, and we try to understand the teachings and one experience, and then we start to ask questions and give answers ourselves. Okay, so for example, if you see somebody, you upset with, angry with somebody, what do we do? Okay, you try to ignore it, like Quack said, ignore him, ignore him, walk away. If it doesn't work. It keeps coming back over and over again, even though he's he disappeared completely from your, out of sight, out of mind. And when you meditate, it keeps coming haunting you and all that. You can't do it. You can't quiet down your mind. You can't meditate. You can't do anything. You keeps hearing it. He, you keep seeing it. Then you try to divert your attention to some something else, to somebody else. Go into the garden, do some, sing a song, write a journal, make a click, you know, or dance. You know, whatever, and if that doesn't doesn't work, replace the thought with its opposite. You know, do something. Anger, okay, I'll send him matter. Anger, okay, I'll love him. Okay, anger, oh, he's so happy. I'm so happy. You know, replace it with darkness. Replace the darkness with brightness. If that doesn't work, sometimes a lot of time it doesn't work. Take a hard look at it. Why do I hate him so much? <laughs> Why am I so angry? What's happening in between us? Is there a deeper reason than just this surface anger? Actually, a lot of times when you go down to point four, you can easily find an answer. You start looking at it. Is it worthwhile? I have lost so much time or en and energy already. Is it really worthwhile? I'm going to die very soon. I'm going to die very soon. Maybe next breath. Are you going to be so angry and you carry that anger to your grave? <laughs> We won't forget now. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, and if you still have that anger, sorry. Last of all, if you still haven't run one, then crush it with all your efforts. Okay, I'm angry. Deep breath, anger. Okay, anger. So you start to wrestle with it and try to win it like a crush like a strong man crushing onto a weak man that's what the Buddha said like a strong man crushing onto a weak man he said I was wondering can you just release it to the universe how scream on your head out no just it's just energy if you can be so clear headed you won't need all these five steps Right? You say, <gasps> like that? <laughs> <laughs> That's so easy, right? <laughs> so easy. <laughs> he said, let my blood dry up and let the flesh of my body wither away and let my body be reduced to a skeleton and I will not give up on my meditation seat without attaining enlightenment. Ooh, you have to have that kind of determination to fight your own own calamities right uh, it's really not easy don't let this unwholesome thought taking over our mind because because it's going to what plant so many many unwholesome seeds in that field and in the future you will be, have a very unhappy life and right here you are already unhappy unhappy here unhappy thereafter Nobody can help you, sorry. So the skillful effort we 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 use is actually to put a you know, give the power, give the fuel to actually uh to power off our accomplishment of every step to happiness. So this mindfulness is very important because uh without this mindfulness we don't know where we are and which which technique to use and what step to follow. Okay? So with skillful effort, we will be able to overcome a lot of tension, anxiety, and and worry. With no skillful effort, it give us it, it give us this opportunity to react, and then then we just keep on multiplying. But of course, as I said just now, like efforts should be on a on very balanced, not too tight, not too not too loose, unless the instrument won't play. Okay, the 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 Buddha once asked a horse trainer, "How do you train your horse?" No, the horse trainer asked the Buddha, "How do you train the How do you train the disciples?" And the Buddha asked the horse trainer, "How do you train your horses?" And the horse trainer said, "Oh, I I train them very gently, and it doesn't work. I train them very harshly, and it doesn't work. I kill them." And the Buddha said, "That's what I do to my disciples. I train them very gently. If that doesn't work, I train them very harshly. If it doesn't work, I kill them." And the, the horse trainer said, "You kill them? You're supposed to be a wholesome person. How can you kill your disciples?" He said, "By killing them, it's not by killing really physically killing them. It's actually ignoring them, ignoring them, and sort of like outcasting them. And that's what he did to his charioteer. Uh, is is it charioteer? His chariot, his chariot, Channa." Channa was his chariot, and then Channa became a monk. And Channa thought, "Oh well, you know, I serve my I serve my prince now. I serve my Buddha, and I'm somebody, big big somebody." So Channa was so much pride and arrogance, and he always didn't want to pay attention, didn't want to pay any respect to all the senior monks. And <clears throat> the Buddha told Ananda, at the end of his life, he said, "You chuck him out." Of course, he didn't use chuck. Chuck him out is the American thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's not an Indian thing. He said, "You abandon him, you ignore him, you so desert him." That means by killing him. And when the Buddha died, Channa Channa knew he didn't have any more the support, and he knew that he is not going to be very happy because he never respected people, and how can people respect him? Right. That would be like a death.、Though. It's already a death. That's yeah, like a killing. Yeah. Yeah. That's what the Buddha said. So, how did the horse trainer? That's what Channa, the charioteer. Oh, great. 
So as we develop in mindfulness, we realize that negative states of the mind and not it, though, it not only distorts our life, it not only destroys our life, it also makes us and ourselves and our friends, our families so miserable and painful, right here and in the future. But we know that the mind keeps going back to the old reactive pattern, and we can be easily trapped in this. That's why we always end up in this samsara, going round in circles, life and death, life and death. But with proper effort and correct effort at the right time, we are able to polish a little bit, little bit, little bit at each time. So mindfulness is the word. That's why it's the one of the step, great step of, you know, to happiness is to be mindful. All right. Did Shanna ever get another chance, or once you're killed, are you killed forever? Well, next life he probably get another chance. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't go on anymore. But next life, maybe if he could remember and if he correct that lifetime. Would but he know that he was on the. Like, would he know that he? Was he knew dead? after the Buddha died. He knew after the Buddha died when he didn't have the support of the Buddha anymore. So he knew that he 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 is going to be a very unhappy person. But there was no story about him afterwards. How he was afterwards. So I couldn't make up any story. Okay? So, yes, Mali. Now, um, I think we listened to a Dhamma talk. Um, we are completely engaged in the discussion of what you're saying. Um, so would that be considered mindful? Yes. Practice? Yes, yes. So it's about one hour of mindfulness. Mindfulness, practice. yeah, 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 yeah. But you see some people listening, but they don't listen. Their mind is somewhere else. Yeah. If, you're <laughs> if you are completely engaged, that's very that's mindfulness at that present moment. It's listen to a dharma talk. When you chop your chop your vegetables, if you are very mindful and chopping, and you know all this, what's happening with yourself, what's you you know which is, which thought coming in, which thought going out, that is mindfulness already. Yeah, any job that you're doing at that moment. You're completely into it, and also you completely tune into your own own mind, to your own body. Yeah. Then your mindfulness. Yeah, you're not separate out. Yeah. That's mindfulness.